When you hear the phrase, soft as steel, what do you think of? While the word steel might conjure up images such as massive high-rise buildings, where does the soft part come in? And what exactly does this mean in our work and in our lives? Welcome to the Soft as Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran. Featuring engaging conversations with a wide range of industry leaders around soft skills, how we practice love, inclusion, social justice, and compassionate leadership that's everlasting in the workplace. And now, here's Dennis Duran. My guest today is Dr. Norman Fortenberry, the Chief Executive Officer of a 35-year-old organization, Great Minds in STEM. Their vision is to achieve a workforce of science, technology, engineering, math, and medical health professionals that is fully reflective of the rich diversity of the nation. And the mission is to inspire, support, and recognize students and professionals, especially those from underserved communities, to create a talent pool of STEM leaders dedicated to serving the nation. Norman is an MIT-educated, highly regarded executive leader with extensive experience in program and project design, development, implementation, and evaluation in the public, nonprofit, and academic sectors. He is a strategic visionary known for building, maintaining, and enhancing highly effective organizations that often exceed their goals. He's an experienced fundraiser with proven track record in garnering funds from government, corporate, individual sources in support of academic programs at the pre-college, undergraduate, and graduate levels across engineering, science, and mathematics disciplines. I am delighted to have the opportunity to have this conversation with Norman. As each day passes and so many aspects of all industries' enterprises change, we are talking about the demand for the identification and cultivation of workers as an overarching challenge faced for virtually every need, whether for skilled craft and trades or college-educated engineers. The critical need demands that we attract all. This connects to the continuing requirement to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is the connection to my message about people. Norman, I'm delighted to have you on my show today. Dennis, it's a pleasure to be here. And and I know you mean that. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) What else would you be doing on this particular day at this particular time? (laughs) For me to kind of nuance a little bit and bring, let's call the non-professional, you might say higher level positions, roles, and career paths with what I talk about a lot, which is the construction industry, where their biggest challenge when we talk about workforce is individuals simply to attract into the industry in order to fill positions that are being vacated by individuals who are retiring. And their challenge is to attract and use more creative ways of doing it, attract entry-level individuals into what they call the skill, craft, and trades. I think in terms of just thinking about your organization, that we're not doing different things. We're organized in a different way. Some of the attraction of individuals and trying to cultivate new individuals into different careers may be done a different way when you're talking about crafts and trade versus professional positions, where the professional positions, you know, seed the process, even at the elementary school level, which I think your organization is even involved at that level in trying to help people understand what STEM is all about and why it's so vital to try to give individuals an opportunity at the very earliest ages and then through their preparation, whether it's a traditional academic preparation or through technical education and training that's done by a number of the unions across industries where they do a good to very good job of providing training in the technical or what I call from the bench that I operate from hard skills. And when we talk about technology, when we talk about engineering, those are all hard skill focused practices and opportunities for individuals to enjoy career paths. So I guess my first question is a simple one. Does my talking about these two different groups or pools of individuals, of workforces, in the same conversation, does it make sense? Is it acceptable? Uh, Is it productive? Dennis, the first thing to understand is that they're not two different workforces. There is a continual One of my early efforts was I talked about the engineering professions, and I explicitly put an S on the end of it. And this actually follows practice that was done by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers back in the 1970s, probably around the 70s. We have the skilled trades. We have technicians, technologists, and engineers. In any type of technical organization, that continuum exists. Each part of that continuum is essential to the success of the organization. 
and each part of that continuum contributes to the success of the overall. And each has its own specialized knowledge and skills that we are dependent upon. So there is a continuum and there are people along that continuum. Um, and I guess the only, my only thing is to make sure that if somebody wants to move along the continuum, that they have the opportunity to do so. But in terms of we're drawing from a, a broad national pool, frankly, international, uh, people have different interests. They have different levels of preparation. And so we, we invite them to be part of that continuum as their interest and their preparation allows. So that absolutely makes sense to me. Good. And I, and I appreciate the way you the way you characterize the, the notion of a continuum makes total sense to me. And it's a m much better way of explaining it, uh, probably probably for the reason that you have it, you're an MIT graduate. You know, I just went to Maryland, you know. So again, it's it's uh, it should be expected that I would talk about it in that way and forgive my humor. But as you know, for our initial conversation, I do have a sense of humor and I just can't I can't control myself at times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but, but all right, um, and there's there's always a place for humor uh, because again, as as you know from our, our initial conversation, um, the 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 platform that I speak from is a platform that is about the people in industry, in the construction mm -hmm. industry specifically for me, but just in general. Uh, and I talk about soft skills, uh, which you also refer to as professional that skills is. in that interview that I visited. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, I refer to soft skills as not really being skills, uh, but more being the qualities, the attributes, the traits of uh, a manifestation of an individual's personal values uh, and how they go about first understanding them uh, and then uh, and then sharing them uh, through the, through relationship building uh, as they go through a career path from whatever place they start to the end uh, is by becoming uh, effective uh, communicators, learning how to communicate in better ways, in different ways. Uh, to ensure that there's that the understanding about themselves being conveyed, you know what those qualities are. Sometimes you have to say, well, one of the things you may notice about me is this, uh, and it might have something to do with again how they approach a particular situation or how they react to certain things. Um, but communication is absolutely essential at every phase of, of development, from entry level all the way through retirement. Uh, so I so I talk about about the soft skill stuff. Um, uh, and again, uh, your 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 thoughts are are very much in line with that because again, you know, people's qualities are the thing that are, that are important. Uh, they they matter because those qualities are the basis upon which we make decisions every day about who, how we go about living our daily lives at whatever stage we are, who we are interested in in, in connecting to and building relationships with. Uh, and and how we express what is important to us uh, as we deal with the issues that I know you are heavily involved in, and I and I too am very very closely aligned with the whole notion. You talked you, you talked in your interview. I mentioned it in my introduction of you. Um, a lot of people talk about DEI, about diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, occasionally, I hear people kind of starting to nudge it a little bit, uh, like, well, okay, we've talked about it. Well, we need to continue to talk about it. I know you wholeheartedly. Agree with that. Uh, I talk Absolutely. about I inclusion and social justice is, is, yeah. is the way I reflect those two things. It's, they're, they're essentially the same. The whole point is uh, that uh, you know, across every sector in our economy, uh, and certainly in the construction industry, um, th the need for us practicing uh, all the good, good uh, and reasoned thinking associated with embracing diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion uh, is absolutely vital uh, to the continued ability for the industry to serve its customers. Um, if, if, we don't, if we don't look to the widest pool of potential candidates for every level of position along that continuum that you mentioned uh, and described so well, um, we're going to have an incredibly challenging time uh, trying to succeed as a national economy. Your thoughts? Uh, several. Um, wanted to pick up on your last point. Um, yes, diversity, equity, and inclusion is all about from a national perspective, utilizing, accessing, actually before we get to utilizing, accessing the maximum potential labor pool. Uh, we are all well aware of the demographic trends in this country and technical professions have traditionally not drawn from the full extent of the population. But where they have drawn from, uh, 
demographically is a population that is not growing as fast as other segments. So if we are to maintain the workforce that we had, we're going to have to include more elements of the population. That's simple math. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with, I want to feel good or I want to do good. It's about business, the bottom line, we need workers. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, um, I think as well, um, we need to be clear that, you know, people need to make informed choices. Uh, you know, it's one thing if, if I choose not to be part of that continuum because I was exposed to it and I didn't like it. It's another thing if I'm not aware of it. And we have not been as proactive as we need to be in reaching out to all segments of the population to make them aware of the opportunities that exist. And so we are losing by default because, as I just said, we've got a demographic change that's happening. We have other segments of the population that could serve our needs, but they aren't aware of us. And so they are opting out by default instead of opting out by choice. And we have to find ways to provide the maximum uh, exposure so that whatever the percentage is, we get our fair share. Mm -hmm. uh, so informed choice is a crucial part of what we have to do. Um, there was a third point, but I just forgot it. So let's keep moving on. <laughs> That's okay. It'll probably come back up momentarily. Um, one of the things that I that I, I say often in the form of a, of a question and that I put to, to individuals and groups and audiences that I speak, have the opportunity to speak to uh, is the question, what is one thing uh, that every person in this room, in this audience, in this space has in common with every other person? And I pause for a second because nobody ever gives, it, gives the answer or blurts it out. And my answer for the purpose of our conversation and for what I talk about often is that we're different from each other. Um, that is something, that, that's, a, that's a commonality. Um, there, there's not a single human being that is virtually identical in every regard, every dimension uh, to another human being. It's, it's common sense. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, and some of it's generational, unfortunately, some folks hold on with both hands uh, to the notion that because you're, you're different than me, that's a problem. Uh, or that's a, that's a hurdle. I don't know if I can get over, or or my my my, my experience, which is in a, then then boils down to my bias, is this or that, sure. um, and therein lies uh, why I said there's a need to obviously continue to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because we uh, I'll say it blunt, we ain't there yet. Right. Um, and uh, and you, your the programs that you that you are conducting through through your organization, uh, other great efforts. Um, there there is a greater degree of coordination. One of the actually one of the ones I think about often uh, is the ACE mentoring program, uh, uh -huh. which was founded I think uh, probably at least twenty years ago by uh, by an architect, uh, a guy named Charles Thornton, um, and that's it's a thriving organization today, targeting underserved communities at yep. the high school level. Yep. Teaching them about uh, about engineering, science, technology, um, in, and and geared around the construction industry, yep. the building process. So, so there are many good things that are going on. Um, but you made a, a, you've already made a, a wealth of great points. But one of the points you made is that we we have to give them the give the individuals the opportunity to choose uh, to 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 make an informed decision uh, to 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 learn about. Uh, paths that may be better suited to who they are as right. human beings who have developed their their brain, their consciousness, et cetera, over a number of years. And again, I, I can remember, and I, again, I think I'm, I'm a fair, fairly, fairly, fairly bit older than you. It, it explains why I stutter sometimes. Um, but uh, you know, I didn't. I, you know, there was no conversation in my household about, you know, there's a number of things that you can, you can do as you're finishing up high school. Um, maybe you should take the, uh, the carpentry cl uh, class mm -hmm. they have at the high school and just see what that's all about and see if you like working with wood. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should do this or do that. None of those conversations were had. The only conversation was, well, okay, when you get out of high school, you're going to go to college. End, end of conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 that's, and that's my story. That's what I did. Yeah. I ended up uh, in a four-year educational institution. I got a, a degree in accounting, 
and I became an accountant upon graduation. Uh, and that was the result of a question I put to my father in my junior year of college where I said, well, what am I going to do when I graduate? I'm, gonna, I'm getting an accountant. What am I going to do? He said, you get, you get a job as an accountant. There's plenty of those kind of jobs around. It's not a problem. So that was the end of that. Now, here's, here's where it comes in and touches, at least in, in my view, uh, and it's, it's not the most sophisticated view, but it, it kind of makes some sense. And that is when we think about, you know, what comprises the, an individual, each, each individual. Everybody's personalities are different. Uh, their experiences are different from birth all the way through, uh, you know, young adulthood. And that's what's formed all the wiring in their brains, which gives them the basis to be able to know if they're exposed to it, if they have the opportunity, that I'm probably going to – I probably would be better at that than I would be at this. That may be a technical position, maybe a soils technician, uh, yeah. which is a certificate program that you can get in, in different kinds of technical colleges. Or maybe I should pr pursue a path that's going to get me a, a degree in mechanical engineering because I, like I like putting things together and seeing how they work. But th those opportunities aren't necessarily made available uh, as much as they need to be. And they're, they're less available to that portion of the population where there are numbers and that is right. the underserved communities right yes absolutely true so two things um one in terms of the value the attractiveness of having people with different perspectives and different viewpoints i mean we've got the research now falling over itself just stacks and stacks of research papers about the value to having different perspectives when it comes to solving a problem and so when we pull in people with different perspectives, different viewpoints. It may be a little tense at first getting used to each other, uh, but the ultimate value to an organization is that having people with different perspectives, different backgrounds, different experiences uh, brings extreme value to the organization. And, and we know that from any number of examples and any number of research studies that have been done. But that takes me to the point that I forgot earlier um, in terms of your earlier statements about the soft skills or professional skills. You know, I, I'm a mechanical engineer, and so people think of that as a very hard technical discipline. But ultimately, engineering is about serving the public. And to serve the public, you have to understand human motivations. And that is why the teaming, the communications, the other so-called soft or professional skills are important. But it's also why at the collegiate level, we insist that engineers and computer scientists study the humanities because you cannot serve humans if you don't understand humans. And understanding of humans comes through uh, at, at some level, at a very strong level, the humanities. And so that's why that's part of the engineering and computing curricula. Um, so this, this, the value of difference. And, and, and let me give you one, one more, one of my tired examples because I abuse it horribly. The, the analog that I draw is to genetic diversity. Uh, a population that is genetically diverse, and humans aren't by and large genetically diverse, but say in, in the animal kingdom, populations that are genetically diverse uh, are more resilient to changes in the environment. They are able to adapt to changes in the environment and continue to exist. So when we bring together people with different experiences and different skill sets, to me, that's another example of quote unquote, genetic diversity, strengthening the overall organism, which mm -hmm. is wherever people happen to be employed. So why are we continuing to struggle with the notion of accepting the, the, the benefits of diversity, the benefits of trying to reach every, every part of the workforce eligible pool of uh, potential individuals. Why, why are we gonna continue to struggle with that? For whatever reason, some elements of the population are trying to convince other elements of the population that we're in a zero sum game. That if I try to be more inclusive, I am in fact excluding someone. That is not the intent and frankly, it's not the reality. But, I mean, you know, you get really philosophical about this, and I, I, I don't necessarily want to do that here, but there are, when Henry Ford, so I, I will give it an, a historical example from a technical industry. When Henry Ford set up his production line, the story is, I don't know if it's true, I wasn't there. But the story is that when he set up his production line, he set up a three-part workforce. 
Uh, he had uh, native whites. He had immigrants who at that period were on the border of becoming white, if you look into the history of what whiteness means in this country. Because you know, was it, remember the, the signs were no dogs or Irish allowed. So mm -hmm. you know, there was a time it took before there was acceptance. And then he had an African-American population, a black population. And one of the things that he did is he set those three populations against each other. You got to watch out for these folks over here. You know, they're aiming for your job. And in doing that, he controlled his workforce. He controlled his labor pool, kept his costs down, kept the demands down. Whether or not all that's true, I don't know. I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me plausible. And I definitely believe that some people currently are pursuing a similar strategy. They're trying to keep workers, employees divvied up so that they can control the overall process for whatever aim they hope to gain out of that. And that's frankly why I think we hear so much concern because there's somebody who's benefiting from this degree of, of opposition and infighting. When in mm -hmm. fact, we would all benefit if with everybody working together, but it's being, it's being framed as a zero sum game in order for, in order for John to gain, Mary has to lose and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with your, with your thoughts. The story is interesting. It, it seems very plausible. Yeah, it, it causes me to think about one of the, uh, just the, an overall thought about the industry that I have the most experience with, which is construction. And when we talk about the construction industry being very, very slow to change, very resistant to change. Um, and one of the areas that they are resi have been resistant to changing in has affected uh, their ability uh, to have an adequate uh, workforce. Uh, and that is expressed this way. Um, I'm, I'm an apprentice. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm on the payroll of a, of a union contractor. I get some training at the union hall. Uh, most of the training that I receive is, is, is using the model that's been in existence for generations, referred to as OJT, on-job training. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I have, I have a problem. My problem is that, that when I, when I, as I'm trying to learn things, this is the apprentice. Uh, if I ask a journey person who has five, seven, ten, fifteen, thirty years of experience to help me. Their their response is no nah, no no I I'm not, I'm not helping you or any other apprentice because you, you're going to take my job. That that thought mm. process is, is still is still somewhere in the weeds around around dealing with uh, uh, apprentice journeyman journeyman uh, uh, movement and the relationship between those two segments of of a workforce. Uh, and it's not just a union organization because apprenticeship is obviously is not simply a, a union uh, experience. It's right. also in, in, in an open or, or non-union setting. But that still that still exists. And the other that, that still exists, and you mentioned it earlier, and I, I, for, I forget the context. And the, the other is that there are still a sufficient number of individuals uh, in my generation, baby boomers, uh, and, and particularly those in a lot of positions of, of management, senior level responsibility, senior leadership across industries. But again, I speak from the one I have the most knowledge of. Um, and what they, what they are continuing to do is they are continuing to perpetuate uh, the resistance to change. Mm. Um, they, they, you know, they, they just don't want to do it any different, to use blunt terminology. Even if it's just talking about something in terms of a, a simple use of different methods or materials in the construction process, let alone, you know, recognizing that, that, that because these 10 workers uh, that we've hired uh, have as their first language Spanish, um, it's just not going to work, folks, because they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm 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 saying in a in a very direct way, and and, uh, sure. and with respect to all, um, but you know, we also know that that Hispanics represent th roughly thirty percent of the construction industry workforce, uh, and they are by reputation uh, and probably begrudgingly are described, even with the language issue, is some of the hardest workers any contractor has. Yeah. So why? And so then we go back to you know that's it's the Henry Ford thing. It's yep. kind of like another version of that same thing. Your thoughts? I I I agree with that. Um, I um, you know part of uh, again I come at this as as an engineer. Um, one of the things 
the adjustments that has to be made as, as the country moves forward or as professions move forward is we have to think about what is essential and what is not. What has to be maintained and what do we have to be willing to let go of? Uh, the folks who are locked into, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way I'm comfortable. It doesn't work anymore. You're a dinosaur. You know, it's mm -hmm. adapt or die. Yeah. You know, that's the choice, adapt or die. And there's no reason to die because adaptation, while it may be challenging, is not impossible. And the benefits are significant. Uh, we... Uh, have ways and we can find additional ways to accommodate, incorporate, evolve, and move forward. And that's what we have to do. You know, if, if somebody is speaking Spanish on the job, to take that one example, um, unless they're unable to understand when direction is given, does it really matter? Mm-hmm. Is it impeding your ability to do your job? Probably not. It just grates on you because you don't know what they're saying and your ego is such that somehow you think they're talking about you when nobody has time to talk about you. Nobody's thinking mm -hmm. about you. Mm -hmm. So just do your job and move forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, and, and again, the, the other term that describes uh, that, uh, that behavior is bias. Yes. Uh, you know, there's, you know, bias is rampant. Um, Implicit bias is, uh, yes. is do it dominates, and it just it makes it very very difficult for people uh, uh, of goodwill uh, to try to uh, um, provide an atmosphere where change, where evolving, uh, where recognizing the differences are not impediments; they simply are aspects that describe one person versus another. Um, this conversation needs to continue. Uh, and your organization is, 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 is serves an important role in concert with the work of other organizations as well. Um, as, you, as, you, as we are in this conversation um, and you're looking for, you've been in your position for roughly a year. Uh, you have some, some incredible stops along the way in your journey. Um, it's impressive. And I mean that. Uh, I mean, as a compliment, uh, it's, you've done a, a tremendous number of things and all progressive, but all focused around some of the same themes yes. and some of the same beliefs that you operate with. Um, what's the what's what's the um, kind of a, a kind of a hopefully an uplifting thought what, as you as you sit at, in your position and you look at what's going on with with the STEM? Let's call it the STEM movement, sure, uh, because I think it is a movement uh, of, of sorts. What what uh, what causes you to feel optimistic uh, about some of the things that, that we've been talking about and, and the future of STEM, but also how that how that uh, the, 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 that kind of cascades into every aspect of of the economy, society, yep. etc. We live in an increasingly technological society. You know, technology is all around us; it pervades what we do. A lot of it has gotten to the place where it's invisible. We don't think about it, but it's there. What gives me hope and what I find uh, encouraging is when I talk to young people. And as you said, Great Minds in STEM, it's been out for 35 years. We inspire STEM excellence in pre-college populations. We support it through scholarships, fellowships, and social support in college populations. And we recognize STEM excellence among professionals and across that continuum, but especially with the young people. I see enthusiasm, I see creativity, I see a desire to contribute to making the world a better place in great ways and in small ways. And so that's what gives me hope for the future, not only for this country, but for the planet. We have some incredible young people out there who are really prepared to make fantastic contributions wherever they're able to do so. Yeah, yeah, well said, and I wholeheartedly agree. As I get into the final chapter of my working life, I have the same sentiment about youth and the ones that I come in contact with I'm incredibly impressed with, particularly, and it seems to be, there's a connection to generations, but what I see is there seems to be among the ones that stand out that they're more activist. Mm -hmm. They're more about giving some of their time for purposes that don't generate a paycheck, may not advance their interest, but just serve others. Yep. You know, a closing thought was it would be a quote from a gentleman who is my mentor, has written a number of books on leadership, 
and in his first published book, which is roughly 22 years ago, but it's still as fresh and valuable and evergreen today in terms of how it talks about leaders, what makes leaders great. He says that a person needs to do what they love Mm -hmm. in the service of people Mm -hmm. who love what they do. And I see that in spades in terms of just how you talk about what your mission vision is all about. Your views are fair, balanced, and forward-looking. I see my dear friend who is associated with Deb Martinez, mm-hmm. who I don't mind mentioning. So somebody will hear this name maybe when they play this recording five years from now. Deb yeah. Martinez. I knew a Deb Martinez. Yeah. She's an interesting personality and a wonderful yep. person. Um, yeah, so I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful because there are great leaders like you that are continuing the conversation, pressing forward, and simply not giving up because we can't. Giving up is not an option. Your final thoughts. Oh, thank you, Dennis, for this opportunity. And thank you for the kind words about myself and about Great Minds in STEM and what we're trying to do. I guess as a final thought, I would want to again emphasize that continuum along from earliest technician, technologist, engineer. There is so much that we need in the country and in the world, opportunities that are available for people along that continuum. And it's just crucial that we make sure that we reach out and make people aware of the opportunities that are available. And once we have them aware that we facilitate, not just encourage, but we facilitate, they're taking advantage of those opportunities because that's what serves us all. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Norman, the time has been too short. We both can talk. My Irish came through because, you know, I'm a blabbermouth, but I was enthusiastic and interested about having this conversation with you. And I hope that this time that we spent together will have useful purpose uh, going forward for, for your interests and your organization. And I'm sure that people, young people in particular, that hear us talk about STEM and all, all the other things we've discussed today, hopefully they'll be encouraged that there are a couple of uh, older generation individuals, among many, that have their back, so to speak. Yes. So thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to seeing you sometime soon. All right. Thank you, and I look forward to it as well. Thanks for joining us today for this episode of the Softest Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran. Dennis is the author of Softest Steel and a leading speaker and trainer for organizations across many industries and verticals. To learn more about the work Dennis is doing to activate soft skills in the workplace, contact him at DennisDuranSpeaking.com. Be sure to check out his book, Soft as Steel, on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you'd like to get your podcasts. And please remember to share this episode with your friends, colleagues, and anyone you feel would benefit from the conversation. We'll see you next time on the Softest Steel Podcast with Dennis Duran. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.